Our Storm King Thunder campaign starts at Bryn Shander. So let's turn the attack on Bryn Shander into attack on Titan. This video is sponsored by Describe, but more on that later. Now this advice works best in context. So before you run this session, you should have read chapter two of the module and watched this whole video series. Sometime before the day that you run the session, you should have run your session zero and the party should start at around level four, but it's okay if you've just come from a different campaign and the party's level five or something close. The advice I tend to give on this channel is pretty loosey goosey. It's the kind of advice that would have helped me as a dungeon master, but not everybody plays in the same style that I do. Some people prefer more explicit and direct instruction. So on Patreon, I've repackaged this advice from this video, distilled it into a 4,000 word fully illustrated module. And this is by far the best thing I've ever made for Patreon. I'm really proud of it. So if you watch this video and you still feel uncertain about how to act on some of the advice, please consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron. And to any patrons who read the PDF, please let me know what you think, because I want to release a companion piece like this for other video guides. And your feedback will be really helpful in kind of establishing a template for that. The module gives us three options for starting towns, Golden Fields, Tribor, and Bryn Shander. Now the idea is that each town is faced with a different threat, but we're not gonna do that. I mean, it's a waste of our time to prep three different locations when we know for certain that we're only gonna use one. So instead, I'm suggesting we just start our story at Bryn Shander and then bend the conditions in the town to suit whichever of the five giant threats we want to run. Because remember, whichever giants you want your players to face midway through the campaign after chapter four, those are the same giants that should attack Bryn Shander. This is our way of foreshadowing that conflict. So we're gonna cover a lot of ground today. The first thing we're gonna cover is establishing Bryn Shander as a town, including all the NPCs and the locations. The second thing is how to run a cold open in Bryn Shander. And the last thing will be how to run a giant attack in Bryn Shander. Now that's three things. It might not seem like a lot, but it's gonna be a lot of content. It's gonna be a lot. And you're gonna have a really good session, I think. Now, one thing I wanna front load in this video is the overall shape of this first session. I've mentioned this a few times throughout the video for clarity. This first session is all about giants attacking this town. And this giant attack is gonna break up into five parts. The first step is gonna be the cold open, which introduces our players. Then we're gonna have a role-playing scene and it can have some exposition and planning. The third is gonna be a skill challenge to stop the giant's plans. Then we're gonna have a boss battle with the giant commander and their minions. And the last thing is gonna be a little cutaway epilogue to tie up the session and then tease the next part of our adventure. So please keep that in mind. Bryn Shander has an overall purpose in Storm King Thunder and an immediate purpose in this session. The overall purpose of Bryn Shander in our campaign is to act as our party's home base. It's something to help ground our larger adventure because later in the campaign when they go, oh, I wanna buy this, or we need to take some downtime. Well, we've always got this home base in our back pocket and we're establishing this home base as early as possible. Now, the immediate purpose of Bryn Shander in this session is to introduce some core ideas and major players of the campaign. Those core ideas are mainly that this is a wild land, the giants are doing things, and then whatever else is on our expedition checklist. We're gonna do that by destroying Bryn Shander with a giant attack. Physically, Bryn Shander sits on a hill in the frozen tundra, surrounded by a circular wooden palisade. Now, this is the biggest trading hub of this whole region, but it's still pretty basic architecturally. Picture roads of packed earth, sturdy wooden buildings with stone chimneys, the smell of wood smoke, the cling clang shouting sound of industry, home to a resilient people wrapped in furs. If you've played Skyrim, just, just picture a town in Skyrim. Now the module has a map with the layout of this town and detailed lists of which buildings are where. I want you to ignore all of that detail. This town has whatever your story needs it to. All you need to know is the general theme of that town. And you can twist your descriptions to fit that theme. And pop quiz, do you remember what that theme is? Fusro duh, it's Skyrim. Describe Skyrim. <laughs> but for our purposes, Bryn Shander is our starting town and our party's home base. So it needs a few specific locations. For quick locations like this, you just need a name, a function, and one defining feature. That's all. The hooked knucklehead is our tavern. It has a massive knucklehead trout stuffed and mounted on the mantle. Black Iron Blades is gonna be our weapons and armor store. Now everything they make at this place comes out black because of their 11 secret smithing techniques. 
The House of the Triad is our church and healing place. It has these wooden idols, these carved idols out the front, four of them. Well, three are made of wood, but one is very peculiar because it's made of obsidian. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, when you're imagining Brinchanda, it's as simple as that. If any other locations come up in your session, I want you to improvise. Our basic NPCs in Brinchanda are gonna have the same fidelity as the locations. They're gonna have a name, a function, and then one defining feature. Now, if you're a particularly theatrical human, you might decide right now on a voice or an accent for each of these throwaway NPCs. But for me personally, I tend to just improvise the accent of minor characters. And I'm just realizing that's why I can probably never remember the accent later. <laughs> so we're gonna need an NPC to man each of these main locations. Now the proprietor of the tavern, the hooked knucklehead, it's gonna blow your mind, okay? Or maybe I'm just easily shocked, I don't know, but this is something I am not joking about because in this book, in the official module, the character's name is Barton. But in my last video series about the Lost Mind of Foundover, the barman was named Barthen. Now this feels too good to be true. I don't know what to do with this information, it's blowing my mind. But let's just say Barton is a funny duddy dwarf with a, a hook instead of a hand, and he never tells anybody what happened to the hand. The blacksmith and armorer who runs Black Iron Blades is named Garn, and this is the only Warforged person in Brinchander. I don't know much about Warforged in the lore of D&D or how well they fit into this campaign, but having this character be the only Warforged makes them a little special. Garn's personality is very details focused, a classic perfectionist. Now we're gonna need a few guards because I don't know about your players, but my players love crime. They absolutely love it. Can't get enough of crime. So we're gonna need some guards. So let's say we have a guard named Terry and she is rough as guts. She spits, she swears, she dacks her enemies and laughs at their underpants. She is insufferable and your awful players are gonna love her. Now we could also have a regular guard named Malcolm and he's a new recruit. Malcolm's only defining characteristics are anxiety and the phrase, it's my first day. <laughs> We're gonna make sure that Malcolm has a very bad first day. Now we also need an authority figure, someone who can put a rubber stamp on the party's bad ideas. And that's why we have Duvessa Shane, a determined young woman who's one of the town's speakers, who represents Bryn Shander in the broader community of 10 towns. She is earnest and determined. And the most important townie that we need to prep isn't actually a throwaway character, but instead a very relevant ally. We are changing Sirak of Suzale, who is originally like a fisherman or something in the official module. We're gonna change him so that he's a priest at the House of the Triad. Sirak's purpose is to act as a potential battle companion at some point with the party. Because at some point in this first session, we want our party to have an NPC battle companion with them. So we have a chance to showcase our custom battle companion mechanics. I've said battle companion too many times and it feels weird. You can find my free homebrew uh, battle companion rules up here on Patreon. And if the party bounces off Sirak and they don't really want him to come adventuring with them, that's fine. Just find a different NPC that the party does like and then give them Sirak stats because battle companions are gonna pop up a few times in this campaign and they are rad. The second purpose is that Sirak is a scholarly person and can be our info dump about various giant lore. Just look at your expedition checklist, which is also free on Patreon, and start crossing things off. The third is that Sirak is a crucial piece of the Frost Giants' plans. They're trying to capture him. So if you're planning to have Frost Giants attack, then pay special attention to developing this character. When we're role playing, we want Sirak to be likable. So whatever energy the players throw at you, Sirak can match that energy. Is the party righteous? Then Sirak is just. Is the party sarcastic? Then Sirak, hey, he's got a good sense of humor. Are they goal orientated? Then Sirak is very direct. If you can match the party's energy, that's a surefire way to make them like the character. Sirak is also brave. Whatever the party's planning, Sirak is in for it. He's also very capable. The party shouldn't have to worry about him or rescue him, unless of course the frost giants attack and they try and capture him, in which case ignore this point. But you should also pick a voice for Sirak that you can comfortably do. More and more, this will be the advice I offer when role-playing NPC voices. Unless I'm playing into a particular trope like we did with Bart the Cowboy Barkeeper in The Lost Minds of Fandelver. So what information does Sirak know? Well, Sirak is the son of Artis Clymer, who's an immortal hero who possesses the Ring of Winter, which does a bunch of stuff I don't really care. Artis Clymer, he's a character from Tomb of Annihilation, which is another module. So they kind of included Sirak as I guess a link between the two adventures. Hey, wait, 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 let's, let's step outside the video for a little bit. What is up with that? I mean, there's no way that this immortal character, Artist Climber, is gonna impact this story. How is he relevant? 
Like, is this an ad? Is this an ad for Tomb of Annihilation in Storm King's Thunder? I don't know, I don't like it, I don't like it. I mean, they do this in heaps of stuff, heaps of adventures. They're sneaking in, sneaky ads, like sneaky snakes, or this giant's murderer is actually in the Princes of Apocalypse, or hey, this inn heavily features in Tyranny of Dragons. I don't like it. I want these adventures to be discrete, resolvable stories, completely resolvable within the page count of a single book. I mean, I want resolvable juice, but that has given me false juice, invisible juice, unattainable juice. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> what does Sirak know? Uh, he knows some information about the giants, I guess. Because, for example, he could note that out-of-place obsidian idol at the House of the Triads is actually an ancient giant effigy, a depiction of Aman, the old father. Sirak knows the nature of the Ordning and might have some basic insight into the motivations of the different types of giants. Ultimately, Sirak knows whatever we need the players to know about giants. Before we get into this advice about running a cold open, I've really got to ask for your help. If you want to see more of these guides, then I need you to please support the channel in these three ways. The first is to like, subscribe, ring the stupid bell. It actually works and it, it actually helps. Who would have thunk? The second way is to share this video with your friends. On Reddit, on Facebook, real life, Discord, wherever. I super duper rely on word of mouth. And the third way is to become a patron. I make a bunch of custom handouts and DM tools for these videos, and you can find them all on Patreon. Specific to this session, patrons get a 4,000 word module. And if you sign up within a month of this video coming out, it's only five bucks. It's actually the best thing I've made on Patreon this whole time I've been doing it. Check it out. Okay, a cold open is where you start a story midway through the action without explicitly explaining the situation. Instead, you rely on context clues for the players to piece it together. I touched on this briefly in my Shadow Veil one-shot guide, but you know, let's get into a bit more detail here. This is a little short story writing principle. Start as close to the end of the story as you can. That's what we're going to do here. We're not describing our players arriving in town or getting orientated, completing some meaningless quests. Our Storm King Sunder campaign starts with a cold open, and the giants have broken through the walls of Bryn Shander and are currently rampaging through the streets. When you're describing the threats in this session, imagine it's all been filmed with a shaky cam in a disaster movie. There are fires and people fleeing in all directions, and there's fighting in the streets. You know what, you could even just watch Cloverfield or a similar movie and try and capture that same energy for this session. You should put on some tense, you know, some tense music for your game, that'll be fun. The way we're running our cold open starts with the party being separated, but then over the course of 15 or 20 minutes in real time, everybody's gonna meet up one by one. And there are gonna be a few steps here. Firstly, you should describe the town of Bryn Shander before it was attacked. Describe your Skyrim town just briefly so that the players have an idea, an indication of the setting. Secondly, you should pick your most confident and engaged player. Someone who could be a role model for the kind of role playing that you wanna see in the other players. You could ask them directly, hey, character A, where were you when the giants attacked? The third step is to resolve that first player's situation and as it wraps up, bring in a second player. Okay, character A, you round the corner into the market and you see character B. Character B, what does character A see you doing? And then character B takes the spotlight as you throw another threat at them. Repeat this until you've collected the entire party. You're only spending a max of five minutes on each player. In one of these little moments, you should also try and introduce Sirak to the party and ideally get him to travel with the group. Here's the golden rule for running a cold open in a role-playing game. The player's decisions are always correct. You are keeping the threat loose. You're keeping the threat unfocused until a player provides context. So then you can change the threat to accommodate the player's decisions. So we're doing this because when you ask, where were you when the giants attacked, you're not giving the player really enough information about the situation to make an informed choice. You're deliberately making them do an uninformed choice. So it would be unfair to punish them with real danger for making a bad choice. For example, before the player has even placed themselves in a scene, you're not being rigid and deciding that the initial threat is a giant stomping down the street, booting everything in sight. I mean, what if the player said they're hiding in a barrel in the street and then this kicking giant might punish them for not knowing something that you've never told them? For a cold open, whatever the player chooses, it is the correct decision. If they're on the roof, then maybe they're high enough that the giant can't quite reach them. Or if they're in the barrel, maybe the giant doesn't see them and they've managed to sneak away. 
give the player that moment of, aha, I've made the perfect choice. I am a clever bear. I'm suggesting that you improvise these threats based on the player's idea. If you get stuck, then I think it's okay to open up the floor to the other players and ask them, hey, what awful thing happens to in this location and causes you to move on, right? And if they, oh, 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 oh they will suggest the cruelest things to punish each other. <laughs> Here's an example of play. The first player says they're hiding in a cupboard, so I describe them waking up in a cupboard in the middle of the street. The bedroom they were in is demolished by a massive boulder and strewn through the street. Now the first player flees with a crowd to the market. The second player says they're looting a liquor store, so I describe the guards coming to arrest looters, but then the store is destroyed by another boulder, but this time they see the giant he stood a few streets away. The first and second player flee somewhere underground. Now the third player says that they're helping the injured in a cellar. At this point, the whole party is together, and I introduce Sirak as working with the third player to help heal people. Now getting to this final part of the cold open should take you max 20 minutes. If this final stage is actually a, like a little combat counter against some of the giant's minions, that could be cool, but afterwards this is an opportunity to slow down the pace for a bit so the players can ask some questions and orientate themselves properly around this situation. Depending on your party, this might be the first time they're even meeting, you know, so give them a chance to roleplay together. There are five different kinds of giants that could attack Bryn Shanda, but regardless of who attacks, they are all sharing these same properties. So there's only gonna be two or three giants attacking Brinchanda with a horde of minions. Some women are in the town uh, rampaging, others are gonna be hurling boulders from outside. Depending on the type of giant, each has a different goal in Brinchanda, a different captain, like a different commander, and with different minions. If the giant commander is defeated, then the town will be able to rout the giants and win. No matter which type of giant attacks and which type of minions they have, this encounter is our final boss battle for the players, and it's always going to use the same stat blocks. Just reflavor the giant commander to match the theme of your attack, like, oh, they're covered in ice or snow or fire, whatever. So with that in mind, I'll just remind you of the overall shape of this session. Cold open, role-playing exposition and planning, a skill challenge to stop the giant's plans, a fight with the giant commander and the, their, their minions, and lastly, it's gonna be a little cutaway epilogue to tie up the session and tease the next part of the adventure. So now you're definitely faced with a crucial decision as a dungeon master. Which giants are attacking your town? And how does it affect your session? Now you've got five options here. The first three are adapted from the book, but the last two are custom made by me. So if the hill giants are attacking, well, the Lord of the Hill Giants is Gur in Grud Haug, and Gur's plan is to impress the Old Father by eating as much food as she possibly can to become the biggest giant in the world. You should read Chapter 5 to decide if you want the Hill Giants to attack. If the Hill Giants attack Brinchanda, then their minions are goblins, bugbears, and ogres. Rocks and goblins are raining down on the town, and their plan is to get to the centre of town, literally rip a silo out of the ground, and cart it away. Now the players might face a skill challenge to sabotage their giant battering ram, or take, uh, take out the ogres who would carry the silo, or trick the attackers into taking the wrong building. The hill giant commander is named Og. Roleplay Og as a brutish, uncouth, a little gross kind of person. Now this book describes Og as stupid beyond belief. So you can happily put on your dopiest voice for Og. Uh, Frost Giants. Now the Lord of the Frost Giants is named Jarl Storvald, and his plan is to plunge the world into never-ending cold by using the Ring of Winter. This artifact is in possession of the immortal artist Clymer, who isn't in this campaign, but he is Sirak's father. Now the Jarl wants to capture Sirak and sacrifice him in some evil blood magic to replicate the power of the Ring of Winter. Read Chapter 7 to decide if you want the Frost Giants to attack. If the Frost Giants attack Brinchanda, their minions are Winter Wolves. They're looking for Sirak gathering around the House of the Triad, which is where Sirak works. If the Giants can't find Sirak, then they might take hostages or demand villagers hand over Sirak. The players might face a skill challenge to hand over an imposter, or trick the Giants into looking in the wrong place, or they might just hand Sirak over, I don't know. Or Sirak might just volunteer himself, you know. Yeah. It's okay if the Giants succeed in their plans. Now the Frost Giant commander is Drufi. Drufi is businesslike in her approach, very efficient, very effective, and she's here to do a job. Her duty, and it would be a personal failing for her to do anything but her best. 
Fire Giants. If the Fire Giants attack, well, their lord is named Duke Zalto. He resides in Iron Slag. He wants to impress the Allfather by slaying dragons, and he's going to do this by collecting all the pieces of the Voinendod, which is pretty much a massive robot of death. And this means he also needs to steal the Flame of the Dawn Titan from the dwarves to power his forges and repair this Colossus. You should read Chapter 8 to decide if you want the Fire Giants to attack. If the Fire Giants attack Bryn Shander, then their minions are Magmen, Orogs, and Orcs, riding axe beaks. In the centre of town is this massive ancient obelisk which the Giants want to cart away, and they've caused a commotion away somewhere else in the town to create a distraction, while the commander and some of the minions try to dig up the obelisk out of the ground. The players might face a skill challenge to sabotage their plans by hiding the obelisk, or by ruining the distraction strategy, or by destroying their digging equipment. It's okay if the giants succeed in their plans. The fire giant commander is named Ildmane. Now, Ildmane is characterized by his cruelty. He scowls, he spits, he broods. If you want the cloud giants to attack, well, their lord is named Countess Sansuri. And she's trying to impress the Allfather by recovering a lost treasure trove from the ancient ruins of ancient Astoria. In her cloud castle, she's torturing a brass dragon named Felgolos for information about this treasure. But unfortunately, unfortunately for her, she, this dragon has no idea about the information. You should read chapter 9 to decide if you want the cloud giants to attack. If the cloud giants do attack Bryn Shander, then her minions are going to be Griffins and identical Arakokra Simulacrum, who turned to snow when killed. They're looking for this obelisk that does not exist, something that's meant to be a waystone marker indicating some clue about the lost treasure trove of, of Astoria. The torture dragon Philogolus, 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 Lost, 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 Brass, Brass Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the torture dragon Felgolos, he has offered fake information under duress. Torture doesn't work, my friends. So when the attacking cloud giants find there is no waystone marker, they'll do a bunch of damage in frustration and then leave. Distinctive about the cloud giant attack, though, is the floating castle on the horizon and the yells of the tortured dragon inside. The cloud giant commander is named Cressaro, and he's Countess Sansuri's castellan the captain of her guards. Play him as a young, pompous knight, particularly haughty, blindly loyal to Countess Sensuri. On to the last giants, the Stone Giants. Now, the Stone Giant Lord is Thane Kaolithica, and she has the best plan. I love this. Her plan to impress the Allfather is to wipe man-made structures off the face of this fantasy earth. She is literally down to just destroy buildings. Read chapter 6 to decide if you want the Stone Giants to attack. If the Stone Giants do attack Bryn Shander, then their minions are Bear Tribe Barbarians. This is a pretty bizarre attack because their goal isn't to take anything or kill anyone in particular, they literally just want to destroy every building. Imagine the Giants and Barbarians dismantling each building in sequence, targeting supporting beams, maybe even laying little charges to implode bigger buildings, eventually making their way to the House of the Triad. The players might face a skill challenge to sabotage their gunpowder or maybe trap them in rubble or booby trap a specific building so it detonates in their faces. Now, in the distance of this attack, it would be super cool if the players could see the giant flying rock, uh, this giant bird from the stone giant stronghold. Not engaging, just circling and watching. Now, if the giants succeed here, they only manage to destroy half the town before they need to back off. And it is okay if the giants succeed in their plan. The Stone Giant Captain, their commander, well, it's up to you. What do you think would be an interesting personality for a Stone Giant Captain? Leave a comment down below, let me know. And remember, in this combat, regardless of who is in the combat, the stat block for the Giant Commander is going to be the same, and the stat block for the minions, regardless of what they are, is going to be the same as well. And they're both on Patreon right now. If you need any further help with deciding on a skill challenge leading up to the combat with the giant commander, the challenge to disrupt their plans, then the module on Patreon has a rad suggestion, which has the players rolling a skill challenge to liberate a flaming catapult to help with the defense. And then in the final combat, the players could cool down a catapult airstrike with a special flare. It is rad. Now, whichever giant you choose to attack, remember this session is gonna take this shape, the cold open, the role playing, exposition, and then planning. Then we're gonna have the challenge to stop the giant's plans. Then we have a fight with the giant commander and their minions. And the last thing that we still have to do is a little cutaway scene to tie up the session and tease the next part of our adventure. So the last part of your session is gonna be this cutaway epilogue. So Describe is the sponsor of this segment. So I use Describe to help get started writing this epilogue. 
let me show you how Describe can help improve your writing. Describe is this massive searchable database of finely crafted box text. If you want some evocative prose about giants or the frozen tundra or a blazing fire for your D&D game, well then Describe has 2700 table ready scenes of creatures, characters, places, spells and more, all made by a team of excellent writers with a dozen or more scenes added every day. Now you can use Describe live at your table, but today I've used it to mine for parts, looking for sentences and phrases I want to include in my epilogue, picking it apart and rebuilding it into something new. So please check out Describe, the link downstairs, make a free account, have a poke around, and if you do decide to sign up for a paid subscription, use the code PERKINS for 10% off. Helps the channel and it's a good service. So the purpose of my epilogue is to relieve and reward some of the tension from our climactic battle. But it also foreshadows a few things from later in the campaign. We need to tell the players about Sirak as a potential long-term ally. Harshnag the Frost Giant, who's a character that will get introduced a bit later. Uh, we need to tell them about the Eye of the Fall, the Eye of the Fall Father, the Eye of the All Father Temple, and the Oracle inside. They need to know about the existence of the Kraken Society and the Gambling Halls. They need to know about the plight of the Storm Giant's royal family with their missing king. They need to know about the existence of Imrith, who is our main villain, and they need to know about the existence of your chosen giant lord and some indication of their plan. So to make this epilogue, I searched for these terms on Describe and then stole little sentences and phrases I liked and just rebuilt it and kind of wrote around it. So check this out. The brisk air smells of wood smoke. And if you closed your eyes and somehow managed to ignore the shouting of fading battle, the scent might even be pleasant. But the sound of your heart drumming in your ears and adrenaline pulsing through your veins keeps you grounded in the moment. Indignant crows caw and flap away, carrying aloft whatever grisly bit they could wrest from the many corpses in the village. The immediate threat is over, and the village will spend months rebuilding, recovering, but they'll always remember the part that you played in their defense. You have allies here. Sirak, the local priest, clasps one of you on the shoulder and promises to aid you in any way he can if you're on the path to stopping this giant threat. Elsewhere, with moonlight spilling across the frigid icy ground, travelling through a dazzling display of crystalline reflections, a lone frost giant adventurer feels the weight of his ancestors and the Allfather compelling him to a holy temple and the oracle within. Elsewhere, on a lavish boat crowded with celebrating patrons, shouting, laughing, gambling, far below deck, a troubled captain spills an ornate coin on their desk. The coin depicts a coiling leviathan, the captain slams their palm on the desk to quiet the whirring coin as they prepare to commune with their master. Elsewhere, beneath the ocean, in a hidden stronghold, a young woman, 25 feet tall, seems less imposing on the storm giant's worm skull throne, doubled over in a moment of grief. The seats in the royal hall reserved for her immediate family are empty, and she mourns their uncertain fate, while her kin and cousins rampage in the realms of the small folk. But standing behind her, an older storm giant woman reaches out with a reassuring blue hand to clasp the princess regent's shoulder, sparks occasionally crackling between her ringed fingers. And on the older woman's face, dragon scale diadem resting on her head, a smile creeps across her features. Everything is going to plan. Now you can see that I've left out the cutaway for your particular giant lord, the threat that you want your players to tackle, because I want you to try coming up with that bit yourself. And if you want to use Describe to help you come up with that idea, remember to use the link below and the code PERKINS if you decide to sign up for a paid subscription. I promise it'll help you out, give it a go. This video took a long time to make because it was 5,000 words of script, and there's 4,000 words, separate words, in the, in the module, and it's fully illustrated. This was so much work. If you're a patron, thank you so much. All these people down there, thank you. If you're not a patron yet, this is the best time to sign up, because for five bucks in the next four weeks, you are gonna get the best thing I've ever made for Patreon. Check out my podcast down there in the bottom right. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you soon.